This is AgGrad Live. We have all of the different segments within the cotton. The show that explores what it's really like to work in the ag industry. So making sure that we get policy and regulatory issues. Straight from the people who live it every day. Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to AgGrad Live. We've had a few weeks off here because we've had a very, very busy winter season. We have selected the first ever AgGrad 30 Under 30. And this show is going to be a really important part of that program because for the next several weeks through the summer and into the fall, we're going to be meeting these 30 individuals that were selected and getting to hear their stories and, and some insights that we can pull from that for, for our own careers. Um, and I think it's a really, really inspirational bunch. I know I've said before on the show, very, very excited about the 30 that we have selected. Um, I, I think it, it took the program to a whole nother, nother level when we realized the caliber of talent we were getting. Uh, and today's guest on the show is, is a fantastic example of that. We have Andrew Lover, and I'm gonna bring him on here. Welcome, sir. Hi there, thank you, Tim. Hey, thanks for thanks for doing this and being brave enough to be the very first one of the group to uh, to get interviewed live on Facebook. Of course. <laughs> well, you are the manager of industry relations at Syngenta North America, and that sounds like a uh, a big job for somebody uh, who's still relatively early in their career. So, tell us, uh, kind of, what does that mean, manager of industry relations? Yes, uh, at Syngenta, I'm focused on uh, commodity organizations, for example, so the National Corn Growers Association, American Soybean Association, uh, and many others, and working with the grower leaders at each of those associations. Also, some agricultural policy. Uh, of course, there are you know, many issues, but also opportunities in agriculture. So how do we seize those? Uh, that's something I'm focused on as well. And then we have a program called Leadership at its Best, and we invite annually around 45 to 50 growers and uh, have a week-long media training, public speaking training, and uh, technology and issues training. So that way they can answer the tough questions from uh, the media and others. And so those are the main uh, aspects I focus on here at Syngenta. Okay, well, so first of all, you already win the award for best backdrop on the show. Oh. I have been, I've been upping my backdrop game. You can see I still haven't hung up my picture. I think about a picture. I've been upping my backdrop game steadily since we moved here to Idaho. But you win already, uh, so I'm gonna stop. <laughs> I'm gonna stop trying. Uh, but, but secondly, I think a lot of people would love to do what you do. I think uh, interacting with people in industry is is core to what you do on a day to day basis, and it's what a lot of other people would strive to to do as well. So, it, it, is there a common career path for becoming a manager of industry relations at various agribusinesses? That's a good question. Uh, I'm certainly grateful for the opportunities that I have uh, here at Syngenta and and every day, you know, I uh, have to pinch myself because this was where I had hoped to, you know, end up someday was in a role like this, influencing, working uh, with uh, with growers and, and external contacts. There's not um, any set path that I would say someone has to set the parameters on, but it would be great to get some experience in, in policy, whether it's working on Capitol Hill or uh, a state Capitol Hill, two places to gain some great experience. I would also say it's important to work in the field. So belly to belly with growers, it's good to know the challenges and opportunities that they have because in a role um, like mine, you're communicating with growers most of the time, but you're also communicating with business leaders. And so having um, some knowledge to bridge that gap and really tie it together and have comfortable conversation is, is, uh, is important. Okay, so you, you, have this, you have this really important role with Syngenta, uh, and I know you're also involved with your family farm still, right? That is correct, yes. Uh, I farm with my grandfather, my father, and my brother. And um, so that's uh, certainly a love of mine too, is that family farm and remaining engaged there, uh, actively farming. But then also, what's this I hear about you're like in law school as well? <laughs> that's that's correct. I, I suppose I, I just needed something else to do uh, with all of that that was presently going on. I uh, Yes, I am enrolled at, at Drake Law School pursuing my Master of Jurisprudence in Agriculture and Sustainability. So it's within the Agricultural Law Center at Drake University uh, within the law school. And 
that's something I'm thankful for to have the opportunity to study there from some great professors. So uh, take us back to kind of where it all started, uh, knowing now that, that you grew up on a farm. It, uh, were, were you sure from kind of day one you wanted to be in agriculture? And, and I guess what prompted uh, or what propelled you to to kind of be in the position you're at now as far as uh, wanting to do this? From the time I was three, I remember bouncing around in the, the buddy seat of the tractor uh, with my dad. And I really looked up to him and continue to look up to him and my grandfather as well. And so I really wanted, you know, to be a farmer. That's what I wanted to be since I was young. I was active in 4-H and FFA, two very instrumental organizations in terms of developing for the future. And from there, uh, went on to Iowa State University. And that's where I studied in undergrad, was a member of Alpha Gamma Rho, um, Agriculture Future of America, and, and many other clubs and organizations on campus. And I had an internship at a co-op my first summer, and then an internship um, with Monsanto and one with Pioneer. My vision at the time when I enrolled in college was I'm going to go to Iowa State and then I'm going to go home and I'll farm and, and work off the farm, maybe at a local cooperative. Uh, that was my plan. Well, I got to Iowa State and I realized how big agriculture was and went on a study abroad uh, to Costa Rica and went to the career fair and saw how many opportunities there were. And it was through those study abroads and internships that I really realized how big agriculture was. There was one profound moment that really changed my life. My junior year, I was involved in the Iowa Corn Growers Association. We started a chapter on campus called the Iowa State Corn Growers Association. Um, and we went to Capitol Hill in Washington, DC as young producers and uh, family members of farms. We were in the Des Moines, Iowa airport I saw Senator Charles Grassley sitting on a bench, eating an apple and reading a newspaper. And I said to myself, surely he sits in first class. He absolutely has to sit in first class. And I boarded the plane. He got on first. I boarded the plane um, after many others. I didn't see him in first class. I thought, where is he? So. I saw him sitting there and I had my, my carry on. I thought, okay, I can either talk to him and for as long as he wants, or I could put my bag up and not talk to him because surely he has much more important things to do than talk to a college student. I decided that it was important to say hello and talk to him as long as I could. I shook his hand. I said, hi, Senator, how are you? He said, I'm doing well, where are you going? I said, actually, I'm coming to see you. So <laughs> right there, uh, we just started talking for two hours. We talked on the way and landed at the Reagan Airport in D.C. Um, and when we landed, he said, how would you like to come work in my office as an intern? And I said, well, Senator, I hadn't really thought about that, but, uh, you know, I'd like to talk to my advisor at Iowa State and get that figured out, find a way to, to make this work. So I graduated early from Iowa State a semester and then I went out to Washington, D.C. right away and started working. Uh, for Senator Grassley. And that changed my life because it, it illustrated the impact that you can have when you engage in this ag policy space. And it opened a door. And, uh, you know, Senator Grassley did that for me. And, and I'm thankful um, for that. And so that's really what, in a, in a roundabout way, got me to where I'm at today. I uh, worked for uh, DuPont Pioneer in marketing and sales in Iowa and Saskatchewan, Canada, where we were introducing corn and soybeans to the prairies. And then uh, again in the, the Midwest in Iowa. And at that time, I, I received my master's of ag business from Kansas State. So I uh, applied and, and uh, got that through Kansas State. And um, then most recently was selling seed and precision services with my family uh, in uh, Iowa, Western Iowa there in farming. The county where we farm was sued over high nitrates in the water. And I was on the corn growers and farm bureau boards. And I was just really, uh, you know, excited about engaging in that process. And so I applied to law school and then that's 
kind of how I, I got to where I am today in the ag policy and, and legal space, if you will. Very cool. Well, I, th I think that uh, Senator Grassley story kind of illustrates um, a big takeaway, I think, from, from your story, which is the ability to to build relationships. And so I, mm -hmm. I, I often get asked the question about, you know, how do you how do you network in a not awkward way where it's, you know, it's real, it's authentic, um, but also, you know, you realize that you're trying to help each other out in some way. So uh, do you have anything that through your experiences you've kind of found that tends to work? Really being yourself, people are most interested in who you are and your story and, and where you've come from and what you're passionate about. I mean, all of us know when we meet somebody who's really into something, whether it's at a, a science fair in high school or, or college, when you're uh, seeing someone just really engage and exhibit that they, they love what they do. And everybody has something. And so to really chase that and align yourself with other people who are passionate is important. It's it's easier to network with people who are excited about those things. And what I've found is that, you know, cultivate those relationships, cherish those. But some of the places, especially where I'm engaged now in this role, is that you're going you're visiting belly to belly with people who may not be on the same page as you uh, and see the issues the same way that you do. But it's equally as important to have just as close of a relationship with those people. And I have found that through uh, listening and then also uh, follow up is extremely important. And so, for example, we'll just use the Senator Grassley situation as an example. Um, when I was visiting with the senator, I really tried to have him talk more than I talked. He certainly has more experience than I have. He has uh, more connections than I have, but I wanted to see where he would let me into his life or where he would show me, you know, some of the areas that he was most passionate about. And, and that's really my um, goal or my hope when I'm connecting with folks is that I can learn as much as I can about them uh, in a way that's genuine. So not like I'm trying to, you know, mine something when I'm networking, but rather that uh, they're sharing their story and what they care about most. And surely there's a connection I can make to that uh, to, to benefit, you know, uh, them throughout their career too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Andrew, there, there might be someone uh, either watching or listening that's thinking, boy, yeah, I, uh, he makes it sound really easy, you know, grew up on a farm, went to a great school in Iowa State, had a lot of opportunities to be involved in things, happened to sit next to Senator Grassley on an airplane. Like yeah. it, it all it sounds like he's kind of just had it easy, but I know, uh, I know that you haven't, especially, you know, one one particular time in in, in particular that you, you um you've had some some big challenges. So maybe could you could you take us back to that point and um, talk to us a little bit about how you were able to overcome challenges in your life? Yeah, without a doubt. You know, as I reflect back on my life, uh, certainly there have been been really wonderful times, uh, but there's also been times of, of tragedy, too. Um, the, the first time I faced that would have been uh, when I was in high school. Um, I had I, I loved athletics and football. And so I w just worked and worked and worked to play my senior year um, um, and, and play both ways in football. And I tore my ACL the, the, the summer before my senior year. I didn't get to play at all my senior year and we won the state championship. And I was excluded from playing time, but I was very much a part of that team. And I took the time that I missed there and uh, invested it in FFA and speech to become a better speaker. And I realized that had that tragedy or adversity not happened then, I wouldn't have invested as much time in FFA or speech. And that's really what I, I you know, am, am benefiting from now. And then also um, I had the same relationship all throughout high school and then um, after college as well. And I was living in Canada, a very long distance relationship and had returned from Canada um, to, you know, re reunite with my girlfriend at the time who I hoped to marry and um you know had asked her her father um for her hand and whatnot and then we were traveling on a rural roadway about five days after i returned from a, a year-long assignment in canada and we were hit um by a pickup truck 
in uh, the side of the vehicle and um, she died on impact and I was ejected from the vehicle and have no recollection of it. Um, but I do remember that when the first responders got there, I was put in a, I was in a van with a woman from a nearby town. That's what I'm told. There's no record of, you know, this woman or anything. And so it's my belief, you know, this was uh, an angel on earth. It was there during a time of just absolute uh, tragedy. And so I spent time from then on with my whole life in pieces. So I had everything in place, you know, an international assignment with a major company and uh, just everything was going well. And then here, my whole per personal life was in shambles. And I also didn't know where to go professionally. I had been assigned to a sales territory and had moved there and everything. Um, but that was really that next phase of personal life too. And so um, thankfully my employer had moved me, moved me to a new location and I started a new sales territory. And it was really about relying on that network of, of family, professional colleagues and faith that helped me through that time. And since then, uh, it's really changed the way I look at things. I look at everything in a way that is more patient. I'm more patient with things, more disciplined as far as that goes. And I'm thankful, uh, you know, just consider it pure joy when I'm faced with adversity. Uh, you know, as the good book says that that's the way that you should should look at things. And uh, now I'll be getting married to um, the love of my life in August this year. And I'm just so thankful for that. Uh, but throughout that time of tragedy, it's just so important. I poured my time into agriculture and my faith. Both of those things are what got me through. I was active in as many organizations as I could be because I knew that if I focused my time there, I wouldn't wallow at home in, in the tragedy and the darkness. Andrew, I, I can't even imagine. Uh, thank you for being willing to share and, and I think um, offer a lot of encouragement to others that, that may be going through, you know, challenges of their own. I, I just can't, you know, I can't even imagine how, how difficult that would have been. Um, know, knowing that you, you know, love farming and, and maybe someday we'll return to, to being, to farming full time. Um, what keeps you motivated, especially when things are tough to continue to push yourself professionally through master's act business, uh, law degree, you know, um, definitely a high profile position, um, kind of what keeps you, what keeps you going? So as I keep moving through my career, I continue to remind myself that I am a farm kid from Lake City, Iowa. And so that's what I always reflect back on is, you know, those days in 4-H exhibiting cattle at, at the fair and whatnot. And my father always told me, the calves eat breakfast before you do. And so it was important to feed them before I ate because they couldn't feed themselves. And that's, again, something I've carried, carried with me everywhere I've gone is executing on, on what I say I'm going to do. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it, get it done um, to, to benefit you know, others. And through 4-H and FFA, just the foundational learning there. I never want to be more than one step away from the farm, you know, while I'm off the farm. I'm glad my brother has an interest in farming too. Certainly it makes it challenging in today's economy. Uh, you know, both of us can't farm full time because uh, there's not enough income there to support my grandparents, my mom and dad, and then my brother. And, uh, you know, now uh, me and my wife as well. And uh, so just having that long term view of success is the fact that in the spring and the fall on that family farm, we can all be involved as, uh, you know, husbands, wives, dads, sons, brothers in the annual planting and harvesting of that crop that generations before us that I never had the chance to meet you know, really poured their heart and soul into to ensure that we could have that opportunity to watch the sunset come up and go down on those crops. And I hope that 
you know, my kids and their kids will have that same opportunity. Um, and my future wife, her family has a farm too. And uh, so just very blessed to, to have that opportunity to work the land. Definitely. Yeah. What about what about in your in your career uh, with Syngenta or, or or another capacity? Um, what could you point to as one experience that you had that you just thought in the moment, like, OK, this is why I do this. This is what I love about what I get to do for a living. Anything like that you could share? There's no doubt that the most gratifying aspect of of my role would be the involvement and in leadership at its best. And helping growers to refine their public speaking skills, their understanding of issues, to stand in front of a camera from Fox News or CNN and speak about what the issues mean to them and, and do it in a way that an executive from any Fortune 500 company could do. You know, most of the time they're doing an even better job of it because they're talking about their family and their land. Um, I also remember, you know, being a younger person under the age of 30 in a room where folks are much more experienced sometimes uh, is something that, um, you know, I, I just reflect upon from time to time. And I remember sitting in a room where we were talking about issues and a farmer leaned over and, and tapped me on the shoulder. And it had been a long conversation and we were just, you know, enduring through it. And uh, it was it was a lot of information. And, and he said, uh, now, Andrew, what what's the most important thing to take from that? And he asked it in a way of I want your opinion on what you thought was meant through that conversation and what's most important to take from it. And that was, again, something that I just I cherished in that moment because he was asking for my opinion. And I know he has 30 more years of experience than I do. but it was important to him to ask me what I, you know, what I thought in that moment. Um, and so really it, it would be that developing growers, cultivating, uh, you know, those growers. I have the privilege to work on a team with um, Mary Kay Thatcher. She has been involved in ag policy for over 30 years. And uh, so I soak up like a sponge, anything from, from Mary Kay too. But those would be the main aspects I'd, I'd highlight. I, I think a, a lot of, uh, especially young professionals, struggle with being put in a capacity where they feel like they need to um, be a leader, but maybe also still want to be respectful to others who may have more experience. And you mentioned a couple times on this interview, you know, like, hey, they had way more experience than me, but here I was, you know, kind of in this in this capacity. So, uh, what types of either mindset or tactics, or how do you handle that situation when you're faced uh, with kind of being a bit of an authority figure? Um, in the company of people who have more experience than you? Sure, it's a, it's a delicate area and one that you want to really be cognizant, cognizant of the situation, the atmosphere and how to go about presenting yourself in terms of, of uh, you know, what you have to talk about or when you need to stand up and say something. So there are a few things that you can control and that is, um, you know, what you're wearing to the meeting. You can always control what you're wearing to the meeting and appear professional. And then also you can come with talking points prepared to the meeting. So one of the things that I do is when there's a, a meeting that's upcoming, I'll communicate with the host of the meeting about what will be covered even beyond the agenda. So even if you receive an agenda, you know, that's like receiving a text message from somebody that you're confused about the context. It's important to get the context behind the agenda. Why is it that this is being discussed? And, you know, so get some, do, do some homework and then talk internally with colleagues who have more experience than you do about how the question should be answered if they come up and over prepare instead of under, under prepare. It's always, always okay to say, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll check. It's important to try to eliminate how many times you have to use that though. You don't want to say that so many times at every meeting, you know, you go to. So it's important to prepare as much as you can. And then typically if there's a reception or if there's uh, just some parking lot conversation, find some, friends or allies, if you will, in those meeting settings who you 
know you can call and ask questions to, and it's okay to ask questions to them and they won't think, you know, anything of it. There are certainly people that each of us, our person, our personalities align with better than others. And uh, so find those people and, uh, you know, have them be your advocates. But um, it's important to stand up and speak. But at the same time, you really do have to recognize where your experience falls in line and just do your best to find the best times to do that. Andrew, I, um, I I know I asked you earlier about kind of what, what are those moments where you it all makes sense? Like it, it makes you feel like, yes, I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing. Inevitably, uh, after we get a job and we've been doing it for a little bit, there's always those things that um, nobody else knows that are really tough about what you do. So uh, is there anything there that you could share? Like, you know, what what uh, what has been one of those things that you've come across? Like, OK, wow, this is uh this is why they pay me the paycheck because it's it's not exactly easy. <laughs> well, um, within the role professionally, and and there are peers at other companies, and internally we have teams too. And within roles like this, it's a lot of conversations, and so knowing what to say and when is incredibly important. I was previously in a sales role, and so the pressure was on selling a certain number of units of corn and soybeans or a certain number of acres of precision agriculture products. So there's pressure there. And every day, you know, you get out of bed with your your hair on fire to go talk to people about buying a product. Well, in my current role, it's more about understanding an idea or a concept and knowing what to say and when to say it. And certainly there are some legal parameters around what you can and cannot say. It's very important to, again, do your homework and talk with people uh, before you say something, if you're ever unsure about making a comment, it's best not to make a comment. Uh, and so that's been incredibly important. Um, within roles like this, there's also a significant amount of travel and uh, travel is wonderful. I know people um, in more senior roles who do a lot of international travel. I love international travel, love domestic travel, uh, but there are months where you know, you're not home very often. And, and that's something that you have to have a very understanding family, very understanding uh, significant other uh, throughout those times. And uh, so those would probably be the, the aspects that are a bit more challenging, uh, but through a support system professionally and personally, you can navigate those waters. Cool. Yeah. I always thought I wanted a lot of travel in my, in my career until I did some. And then I, I thought, oh, well, this is it. near as fun and glamorous as I thought it was going to be. So I, I admire <laughs> right. and respect those of you who, who spend a lot of time on the road because it, there, um, it can be a challenge. There are a lot of meals in airports. Let's just say that. Yeah. And that food gets old pretty quick. You can only, it sure does. You know, you can only have so much, um, you know, McDonald's breakfast before it gets old. Hey, uh, you got a shout out here from Nathan Loudon. A uh, good friend of both of ours says congrats, <laughs> Andrew, on this award. Wanted He's to make wonderful. sure I pop that up on the, st the screen. And anyone else who's tuned in live, if you want to make a comment or ask a question, you're always welcome to do that. But I would love to hear from you, Andrew. Um, your What advice has just stuck with you throughout your career? And, and there's always those pieces of advice where time and time again, you come back and you think, like, that was so true. And then, you, and then another thing happens, you're like, oh, that is so true. And so the advice just kind of sticks with you. What's that been for you? Um, and, and maybe it can help some other people who are tuning in. There was some advice I received a, a couple of years ago, and it was to put your personal life ahead of your professional life and the rest, the, the professional life will take care of itself. And that is something that I truly do believe that if you put your personal life, you know, first, the professional life and your dreams will follow with that. Um, the minute you start putting your professional life ahead of your personal life, it's it, it really starts to wear away at your support system. So say if you're not communicating enough with those who truly love you because you're so focused on, you know, work and et cetera, or, or just gone so much, um, it's just really important to, to keep that personal life uh, first and foremost. Uh, one thing early in my career that has, has uh, I felt propelled things into faster motion was never eating lunch alone. And whether it is the janitor of the facility or the CEO, 
both of them are equally as important. I remember um, John F. Kennedy was touring a space station and he asked the janitor what his job was and he replied that it was to spend or to send uh, space shuttles to the to the moon. And that's so true. Everybody in an organization is equally as important. They just have different roles and spend time in different places. And so early in my career, you know, I was at the co-op and uh, had lunch with folks there, you know, anytime I could. And then especially at Monsanto and, and Pioneer too, um, having lunch with people is where I learned so much. And I grew up that way too, having lunch with my grandma and grandpa uh, when my parents were doing something else or, um, you know, even those times when I could have, uh, you know, when we were uh, slowed down enough to have lunch together as a family. Um, that was so important because I have spent a lot of years uh, spending money, you know, trying to learn things and learning things, but I probably learned more from my grandpa and the time that I had with him on the farm that really set that foundation to then, you know, pursue those other avenues of professional life too. I love that advice. I, I work from home. So a lot of times I'm meeting right here. So you and I will have yeah. to over Skype or Zoom yeah. or something, have to grab a, a virtual lunch together. There you go. You get there your you lunchable. Go. I'll get my lunchable and we'll, we'll have lunch. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> um, well, you're at a, a really unique vantage point. And I feel like you and I, are, uh, you know, we, we, we definitely have a lot of similarities, both in Alpha Gamma Rose, uh, went to the K-State MAB program. So I mm. know uh, a little bit about your background and can relate to it, but I think you've got a unique vantage point in that you are oftentimes coming at things from a producer level uh, perspective and an agribusiness level perspective with the policy side tied in between law school and your, your previous experiences. And I think that's really interesting. So maybe if I could just put you on the spot here a little bit about, you know, what issues are top of mind for you um, in ag? And, and I'm not going to ask for like a, you know, a policy report, but just like, you know, what, what do you think uh, is an important thing we need to be wrestling with as an agriculture industry right now? There's no doubt um, that trade is extremely important. And just speaking from the producer side, uh, last year on our family farm, I had soybeans. I was I uh, was growing soybeans, and um, you know we lost two dollars out of the market during uh, when the the tariffs initially went on. And then um, then this year, you know, I've got corn in a corn soybean rotation. And so we have low corn prices as well. So USMCA, the passage of that uh, would be incredibly important to the commodity markets. And then also to, you know, a trade deal with, with China uh, is incredibly important. So those two trade deals would, would do a lot to benefit the agricultural economy and, and um, the rural communities that feed into it and feed off of it. I would also say the farm bill and the implementation, boy, it was wonderful to get a farm bill and have one, you know, as, as soon as we did, and they really worked well together on it. Uh, but then it's about making those, those programs happen uh, and, and really um, making sure they're executed. On our farm, we have conservation reserve program acres and the CRP is, it's good for wildlife. It's good for uh, also the land and, and removing kind of as a filter for those nitrates when we've got a lot of high corn production as well. One thing I'd point out for folks just on the horizon, uh, if you have an interest and maybe you're aware already, but gene editing is something that is incredibly important to the next generation of agriculture. I grew up not really having to walk beans. Uh, sure, I did sometimes, I think, because my dad and grandpa just wanted me to have that experience, but I grew up as a farm kit of Roundup, you know, we had Roundup out there and really clean fields for most of the time. And then we, uh, you know, we started to see some weed resistance, et cetera. Um, but GMOs, ever since high school, even, we've been trying to, you know, charge to advocate, educate consumers on GMOs, especially from a producer perspective. And now we have gene editing coming in and really edit and, and really educating folks hey, this is not GMO 2.0. This is a different form of, of plant science and we can deliver um, great crops to folks 
that are very safe for you to consume. And there's an initiative called Innovature that the American Seed Trade Association is working on to educate folks on that. And uh, so I would just encourage people, uh, if, if you have time to search Innovature, uh, you know, certainly take a look at that. I hope I spelled that right. You did. Yeah, you did. Okay, good. Yeah. So uh, check that out for sure, Innovature. And um, Andrew, I, I think overall, this has just been a fantastic interview. You're setting the bar extremely high for the 30 under 30. <laughs> I just wanted to, before we hopped off here, take time to congratulate you. I mean, extremely well-deserved. Um, what you've been able to do in your short careers is, is nothing short of impressive. So thank you for being a part of this program uh, and for the contributions I know you're making to everybody around you, including those of us in, in the ag community. So really appreciate it and congratulations once again. Well, thank you, Tim. I sure appreciate it. Uh, and, and just the honor of, of this award is something that I take into this next chapter, you know, of life beyond 32, you know, in, in uh, accomplishing much. And I know that uh, to those that much is given, much is expected too. And that's not something I take lightly. And, and so I appreciate the, the, this award and um, also the nomination uh, from Nathan as well. I appreciate that too. Definitely. And I'll, uh, I'll tell you, there is life after 30. There's still, there's, it's still fun. It's still okay. If, if we were to direct people to one platform, either a social media platform or an email address, if they wanted to uh, just connect with you about anything you talked about, is there a place we could do that? Yeah. It, um, if you'd like to reach out to me, you know, certainly I'm on LinkedIn, also on Twitter at Andrew Lover. You can always ask a, a question to me there. Uh, either one of those, I'll be pretty responsive as soon as I can be. And Facebook as well. Just search my name, Andrew Lover, and uh, you can connect with me there as well. Okay. Yeah. Search, search Andrew's name. I got that right too, didn't I? You did. I'm on you fire did. with the spelling today. All right. Oh, it's well, great. Also, if you want to check out um, Andrew and the other 29 of the AgRed 30 Under 30 and the other AgRed Live interviews we've done, you can do that on YouTube, uh, the AgRed YouTube channel, or you can download the podcast. So if you want it in audio form and not have to look at my ugly mug, you can uh, find it on any podcast player. It's called AgRed Live. But thank you for those of you who tuned in live. And Andrew, thank you again and congratulations. Yeah, thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you for joining AgGrad Live. Visit aggrad.com, that's A-G-G-R-A-D, to join the community, create your profile, and learn more about careers in the agriculture industry.